Hello and a very warm welcome to the Ideas Factory. I'm Nagma. With me is Professor Harsh Pant. Defence Secretary Austin is here on his visit to India and other countries, but this is the first most important visit uh, from uh, someone very senior in the new Biden administration. And India has hopes. In fact, the two countries have hopes from this visit for better cooperation in the defense sector, strategic partnership, maintaining peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific area. Harsh has uh, the statements after the meeting have come out. Uh, you know, Defense Secretary Austin has emphasized uh, how you know the most pressing challenge facing the world or facing India and America is the Indo-Pacific. And PM Modi also talked about a rule-based order in this area, also maintaining democracy in the area. Now, all these comments are a veiled reference to China. Uh, at the same time, this conversation took place hours after the public spat uh, that took place between the US and China and Alaska. We've spoken, both the sides have spoken about regional cooperation, defense cooperation, but there are also concerns about the S-400 missile system uh, being bought from Russia. There are also concerns that some senators have raised about the democratic values, democracy and human rights. So how significant, first of all, let's look at how significant is this visit, considering this is the first uh, high level visit after the COVID times or during these times out of America uh, by from uh, somebody who's very high up in the Biden administration and what is India's expectation from this visit? Uh, thanks, Nagma. You know, uh, what is remarkable, I think, uh, first of all, is that uh, we are looking at uh, these this, high, this kind of a high-level visit and this kind of a high-level engagement uh, so early in, in Mr. Biden's term. And for all the misgivings that uh, I think some sections had early on uh, about Mr. Biden and his administration not being equally invested in the Indo-Pacific have been laid to the wayside. So now we are looking at, at a Biden administration that remains committed to Indo-Pacific, that has signaled its commitment, uh, perhaps a bit differently from the Trump administration, but taking that uh, larger framework forward uh, with great degree of enthusiasm and with great, great degree of uh, you know, um, uh, alertness to the changing geopolitical realities uh, in the region. Uh, so what is, I think, symbolically, first of all, important in this visit is that uh, Secretary Austin is visiting India after visiting two of uh, America's closest alliance partners, South Korea and Japan. India is not an alliance partner. India is, uh, you know, is a traditional partner. India is, is a, is a uh, strategic partner, but does not have an alliance relationship with the U.S. Now, I think... Uh, if you look at the uh, the pronouncements, if you look at the policy statements, it's very clear that Indo-Pacific is going to be a priority and building partnerships in the region is going to be a priority for the Biden administration. So uh, for uh, Secretary Austin to come to India and signal that India is at the top tier of, in of Biden administration's uh, engagement policy in the region, I think will give a great boost uh, to the relationship over the next uh, three, four years, uh, till uh, at least till this administration is in office. So that signaling being done, uh, we, get, we get down to the nitty gritty of defense cooperation. We know that defense cooperation has been the driving force in the relationship for the last few years. Uh, even when we had the disagreements on trade, which Mr. Trump exemplified uh, like uh, uh, you know, none else, uh, defense relationship has been moving forward. Uh, in fact, we had seen great amount of intelligence cooperation happening even during the heights of uh, Sino-Indian crisis on the border. But in terms of defense equipment sales, we have seen America's share growing. Uh, and I think uh, the, the trajectory is very clear uh, in terms of uh, where India and America would move in this, in this direction. There are some concerns, as you point out, uh, there are concerns about uh, potential impacts for uh, for India's other defense partnerships like S-400 deal and Kadza sanctions. If they are if they are not waived for India, then it will have an impact, and I think it will revive some of the anti-India sentiment that uh, still exists in certain quarters in India. And it will give this you know this idea that perhaps uh, you know there is a still a bit of a misunderstanding about. Uh, India's uh, defense uh, requirements in Washington. So we will see how that pans out. And I'm sure this visit will pave the way for 
uh, India making its case to the new administration about what it means to have S-400 in India's kitty and what it means for India's defense requirements, just like it did uh, with the Trump administration. So hopefully uh, that conversation will be more productive uh, and we will be able to convey our concerns to, uh, to Washington. But beyond that, we are also looking at how can we take this relationship forward uh, more towards co-production, co-development at a time when India is also focusing on building its own manufacturing, defense manufacturing base in the country. And that, I think, is going to be a major uh, you know, point of conversation because while America has signaled uh, its, uh, its desire to help India, we know that uh, American private sector is involved and American private sector has often been reluctant uh, to share you know, on, uh, when it comes to issues of intellectual property. And they're very cognizant of, uh, they're very cagey about uh, you know, uh, co-production and co-development. So we will see how that, uh, you know, that space is, will be worked out between the two countries. But by and large, what we have seen is that at least at the governmental level, the initiatives are serious. The initiatives are in the right trajectory. Yes. And both governments seem intent on taking, on building on the past, uh, you know, uh, efforts that have been made in this place. Uh, and as, as you pointed out, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the statement that, that has come out is signals uh, to, the, to the world and to each other that we remain committed to a very robust defense partnership. At the same time, uh, you know, when we look at this, but we also let's understand uh, and or simplify the whole Indo-Pacific aspect. Uh, when you say that it is very significant because India is at, it's, it signals that India is at the top tier of the US engagement in this region. Now, why is India so important? And if we look at the Indo-Pacific and the China angle here, we would, uh, you know, let's put that in context, Taj, that it, this is taking place when the US-China dialogue uh, that took place in Alaska and uh, it uh, kind of descended into a disaster or a bickering. Um, and at the same time, the references, the statements that have come out are veiled references to the threat of China when we talk about the most pressing problem being the Indo-Pacific or to maintain demo free uh, and fair order in this area, the democratic uh, you know, values in this area. So China is the important angle because of which India is so important for America in this region right now. Uh, absolutely. China is, uh, you know, the way China's rise has shaped the geopolitical realities in the Indo-Pacific and in fact led uh, to the very construct of the Indo-Pacific. Had it not been for the rise of China, we would not be talking about the Indo-Pacific as it were. I think that element itself signifies how central the rise of China has been to changing geographical realities around us. And for, uh, for India, of course, uh, we are a neighbor and we face enormous challenges uh, as it has been exemplified by the border crisis last year, which is still continues uh, with China. For America, the issue is how, do, how does America sustain its uh, role in the region? How does America protect and preserve its alliances uh, in the region? How does America signal to the region that it's it's, it remains committed to the region? And uh, for America, that is increasingly embroiled in a number of domestic uh, uh, challenges, uh, which is looking more and more inwards. The question is, how can America work with like-minded countries in the region uh, to work for, uh, towards working for com common goals and common uh, public goods like uh, you know, health and security uh, and prosperity? So I think the challenge is uh, equal in some ways for both uh, countries and therefore it's, it's uh, you know, it seems that there is a natural convergence here between uh, uh, America and, in, and India when it comes to the larger geopolitical reality of managing China's rise and working together. But, uh, and, and what we have seen, for example, is uh, what happened in the Quad meeting is giving uh, the relationship, anchoring the relationship in a wider regional context so that it simply does not become about China. It also becomes about uh, you know, something more positive about the region. So health, diplomacy, thinking about supply chain resilience, thinking about critical technologies, etc. However, uh, when you look at the question of uh, operationalizing what Quad uh, said last week, I think what is interesting now is that we are looking at that aspect coming forward. So uh, Secretary Austin's visit is also about operationalizing some of the ideas that emerged out of the, uh, in, in the court setting. Mm -hmm. and, and that will only happen if, uh, you know, as I said, uh, because America's relationships with Australia and Japan are, uh, you know, are uh, much more salient in terms of their alliance relationship. But with India, much more work will have to be done because India and America will have to work together in a framework where we are not alliance partners. So, uh, so what kind of arrangements would be worked out 
what sort of defense requirements will can be uh, can be worked out i think those questions will be taken on board in, during this uh, engagement but the fundamental point here is what we have seen is something extraordinary the alaska meeting between us and uh, us officials and chinese officials the first uh, you know so called uh, you know in their own 2 plus 2 dialogue where you had uh, jake sullivan and and uh, anthony blinken both taking on uh, the Ch the chinese counterparts I, the, if you look at the tone and tenor of the public statements, uh, we have not seen anything like this before. Uh, even if you go back to Trump's first meeting with the Chinese leadership, it was much more cordial. And we have not seen the kind of uh, uh, anxiety, the kind of uh, you know, even vocabulary, uh, language uh, coming out of these uh, statements that we are witnessing today. So clearly, something is going fundamentally wrong in the relationship. And I think the, the expectation from Washington is that uh, we need to push back and push back hard if uh, we need to make it clear to the Chinese that enough is enough. And so we are looking at a, at a very different landscape today when you, you know, if you look at the Alaska meeting, of course, it was public and in private, they may have had some conversations which would have been more productive, perhaps. But I don't think uh, that, you know, the, that changes the fundamental nature of the relationship, which is increasingly becoming conflictual. While Jake Sullivan talked about competitiveness of the relationship, uh, one senses that it is, all, it is becoming fundamentally conflictual, both in terms of interests and in terms of values, which uh, Biden administration is signaling that they would like to uh, focus on. And, and the Chinese also, if you read their statements uh, in the meeting in Alaska, they talked a lot about American uh, democracy and a human rights situation in America uh, and, and how it is uh, not up to, up to the mark and how, what challenges America faces. So clearly there is a pushback from both sides. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in this landscape, India and America, America relationship becomes uh, fundamentally important because if this, if the, if two major powers in the Indo-Pacific, like China and the US, uh, start confronting each other much more explicitly, then the position of countries like India uh, and Japan and Australia becomes, uh, you know, which are so-called middle powers in the region, becomes even more important. How will they ensure that some of the values uh, that they espouse and some of the interests that they have uh, are protected and preserved in this highly volatile environment? Probably um, China would be thinking at this time that it was easier to deal with Trump. They were looking pro forward to the Biden administration. But uh, as you pointed out, from the very beginning, the tone and tenor and China being questioned on human rights on what they're doing in Hong Kong or uh, the minorities, the Uyghur minorities in Xinjiang. And China, of course, pointed out uh, the United States own track record on Black Lives Matter, on, on human rights. But it augured really purely for the prospect of a rapprochement between the world's uh, two biggest economies, Haj. So we, we're not very hopeful as far as the US-China relationship goes. Not really. I think uh, this is perhaps going to be uh, the new normal in the relationship uh, because uh, clearly there was some expectation perhaps in some quarters that Biden administration's approach might uh, be a bit different. Uh, but what we are witnessing now that Biden administration, because it is looking at the relationship uh, in totality, you know, uh, Trump administration was actually not so much focused on the values question. Uh, they were looking at trade issues. They were looking at security issues, uh, you know, much more directly, but they were not bothered about, uh, you know, uh, what was happening in Xinjiang or what was happening in Hong Kong that, that, that much. Uh, but uh, Biden administration is signaling that uh, along with the traditional issues on the table, these issues will also be part of the discourse. And so if that becomes the case, then there is actually uh, the, the plethora of disagreements and the, and the agenda of disagreements gets enhanced so much that it's very difficult to see where they can converge. I mean, one area that perhaps they can potentially work on is climate change uh, and, uh, and uh, where both have uh, stakes. But if the larger climate of the relationship is so vitiated, is so challenging, then I think the questions uh, about global governance also become that much more problematic. That while yes, uh, the two sides may have some similarities in their in their approach on climate change, in their uh, desire to uh, you know uh, bring global economy back on track, but the fundamentals are diverging so significantly and so fast uh, that we are looking at a virtual uh, you know almost a collapse of the engagement between the two countries. Uh, I mean, if this is the tone of negotiations uh, in, at the very beginning. 
uh, i think it would be it's very difficult to think that this relationship can normalize uh, you know in, in very soon or in the immediate future so the challenges are going to continue much the same way that they were there in the trump administration in fact they are going to be even more uh, get further accentuated perhaps and uh, and uh, therefore i think there is a there is a logic to biden administration's outreach to partners and allies from the very beginning because they are preparing the ground for a more robust engagement where uh, the signal to china is that look we are we will first work with our allies and partners and then reach out to you and then work out a modus vivendi with you which is very problematic from china's perspective which has always seen america and china relationship as fundamental to their identity of china as a rising power yes absolutely and there are uh, not just us uh, you know talking of china and being very wary of china but a lot of other countries are very wary of china or are very cautious and like we see in the you know defense and foreign policy review uh, that came out from the uk and one of the main things was it talks about uh, uh, it's very cautious about china it also talks about russia which is seen as an acute threat to their security they also talk about the indo pacific tilt so what are the main uh, you know things uh, that you would like to point out from that defense and foreign policy review this is i think one of the uh, one of the more uh, ambitious uh, foreign and defense policy reviews that we have seen from coming out from britain in recent times uh, partly because uh, in the in the past britain has been grappling with uh, a number of domestic challenges both in terms of brexit in terms of uh, declining you know economy in terms of constraint of resources but now as britain is formally out of european union and is now looking at revamping its foreign policy outlook this uh, the the new document the new review actually gives uh, you know a, a greater global role for britain and and spouses a role for britain that was missing in the past you know in, in, we have seen post brexit a great desire on the part of british policy makers uh, you know to to reach out to other parts of the world and global britain has been the slogan that britain is not simply a european country but britain is a global power which wants to uh, you know play its role Uh, in sustaining global order uh, uh, in in various parts of the world uh, and at, at the global level as well so what we are looking at from this review is that indo pacific which has become uh, as we have been discussing the center of gravity of global politics and economics and where britain has some uh, interests uh, uh, you know in, uh, in terms of the diaspora in terms of some territories i think we are looking at britain now increasingly using that focal point of engagement to make uh, uh, you know uh, to, to make a case for itself uh, as a continuing uh, global uh, power uh, because there there has been some uh, doubts uh, post brexit that britain uh, will cease to matter in the world because britain has been only working with the europeans and using european leverage uh, now what would britain do and i think what with this review uh, british policy makers uh, are making it very clear that they have no intention of stepping back and they would like to play uh, um, you know as robust a role in global politics as they have been playing and perhaps even more with their with their increasing focus on in, on the indo pacific and the second aspect of course with this indo pacific is their growing concerns about china its dependence uh, its uh, you know the, the role china has been playing in in british economy uh, and of course we have seen a changing mood in britain over the last few uh, in fact last 2 3 years and that means that their partnership with countries like india Uh, becomes very important and so you see a lot of references to india uh, and uh, of course uh, boris johnson's uh, announced visit to india in april uh, would be again uh, um, something that uh, will be watched very closely because that would be his first visit uh, post uh, uh, this pandemic and he would also be looking at uh, and first visit after uh, declaring this new review uh, announcing this new review so there uh, i think the expectation is that uh, india will will be a major focus of british foreign policy going forward especially as they uh, start focusing more and more on the indo pacific and the changing uh, you know uh, order in the region where they want to play a major role all right and before we end this conversation a very quick comment from you on how you understand or how you see you know the comment from pakistan army chief general kamar javed bajwa when he talks about that it's time for india and pakistan to bury the past and move forward and we talks of uh, piece how do, how do you read into this statement i think there is uh, something is clearly brewing there and uh, there is uh, there is uh, certainly uh, we are looking at a sense that perhaps it's important to uh, engagement is an important uh, you know uh, 
it's important to pursue uh, engagement with india given the circumstances that pakistan finds itself the questions i think for pakistan are profound at the moment economically weak politically weak uh, and uh, regionally and not entirely evident uh, that uh, they can manage the regional geopolitical flux uh, there was some expectation uh, again in pakistan in some quarters that biden administration would be different uh, we have seen biden administrations in, if you, if you were sitting in islamabad and you were looking or rawalpindi for that matter and you were looking at uh, uh, biden administration's outreach to india you would certainly be worried that look uh, this is an administration that is so focused on india that perhaps it is forgotten pakistan at all i mean uh, the the afghan peace process where india has been given a seat at the table uh, these are profound changes happening uh, much to pakistan's detriment and also the fact that you know contrary to earlier assumptions about pakistan and china working together in creating a two front problem for india india has shown that india can manage both these fronts even when both fronts are alive so you you know we had a crisis with uh, with china and indian forces stood up to china and managed to uh, force them into di- disengagement we have also seen uh, loc being very very volatile and india managing loc very well so i think there is an expectation that perhaps uh, a more realistic assessment is needed and the ground realities uh, that have been changed by india's uh, revocation of article 370 will also mean that a new realization a new uh, you know indo pakistan engagement will have to be based on these new realities if you read it carefully the statement talks about kashmir but it does not talk about uh, what india has got what india did in uh, 2019 uh, you know uh, and and what what it means for india pakistan relationship despite the earlier bravado if you recall from imran khan so clearly i think there is an assessment that uh, we need to move forward uh, it remains to be seen how far india is willing to give the benefit of doubt uh to to pakistan at the moment because uh, as you know very well there are there will be many in india who would doubt the 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 uh, you know the sincerity of these statements they would they would say uh, you know uh, wait and watch and see uh, trust but verify you know those sorts of questions let us let us uh, so i think a lot uh, the proof of the pudding as far as india is concerned would be in what pakistani establishment does on the ground rather than what it says Uh, and sick, yeah. but i think there is no doubt that th- that conversation is beginning to happen and that's a positive conversation uh, to have it's a significant uh, statement nevertheless but of course like you said many would be wary of it and there will always be that uh, you know you have to wait and watch and what comes out but there is an increasing realization in pakistan of the changing realities as you said so that's it we have time for on this episode of the ideas factory we'll see you next week thank you so much harsh